Hey, welcome back to the study of the Minor Prophets, and as we continue through the book of Malachi, uh, it'll probably be this week and next week. There's only four chapters of Malachi, and next week's a shorter chapter anyway. But we're going to be in, in chapter three this week, and I hope you've been learning, and I hope you've been growing, and I hope you've been going back on your own and studying this for yourself. Just don't always take the, the teacher and the speaker, what he's saying, be like the Bereans and go back and study the Word of God for, your, for yourself and, and allow God's Spirit to, 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 to show you, to breathe in you, to, to, to allow you to understand Him. And the more you understand God, the more you understand, I mean, His character and who He is, then you begin to more believe and trust in the promises that He has, that he has spoken over your life and over your family's life. So let's turn to the last book in the New Testament. Uh, we have been saying through the our study that this, even through Malachi, it's been important for those who maybe have allowed their relationship with God to dwindle into a place of complacency, uh, where you are going through just emotions, or you're, you're reading your Bible, but it's almost like you're dry, you're arid. It's, it's almost like you just do it because, you know, you did it, your grandmother did it, your mom and dad did it, so you eh, I'll figure I'll do it. But this is where Israel was at at the time with Malachi, and Malachi is calling him on a carpet, basically, He's saying, listen, you're losing hope. And they were losing hope in the prophecies of God. Uh, They they didn't really see things coming to pass in their their minds. And, you know, for me personally, I think they were believing just looking forward to seeing the Messiah coming. And it it wasn't happening in their time frame. We know that that everything that God said in the Word, that it's going to come true. You know, as as he wrote it down, it it happened. Amen. And and it's going to continue. So let's go to Malachi chapter 3. <clears throat> Verse 1 says, Behold, I send a messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So if we start looking at this first verse, as we look at the first verse, we see two characters, my messenger and the messenger of the covenant. Now, we know the first messenger uh was to prepare a way before me. Now, who is this? Who do you, who do you think? Uh, who do you think Malachi is referring to? Um, we know who it is because Jesus quotes Malachi in, in Matthew chapter eleven. So turn your turn your Bible to Matthew eleven, or hit your iPad or your phone, however you're you're even watching this today. <clears throat> Go to verse seven through ten. It says, as they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you? What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind. Now, reed shaken by the wind, real quickly, is people who were swayed by public opinion. Okay, verse eight. So why then did you go out to see a man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in the king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he whom it is written. Behold, I send a messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. So Jesus quotes Malachi, and I believe it's in all four gospel accounts. You can go back and look on your own. That John the Baptist came to prepare the way of the hearts of, uh, of Israel to receive their Savior. Uh, John's job was to preach repentance, to get people's heart, to open up their hearts to receive God's word, prepare, prepare people to receive God. And, you know, you know, think about it back then, and think about it now. People's hearts sometimes get hard. And it's going to take God's Spirit. It's going to take God's Spirit to tenderize that. You ever eat like a, um, a really tough piece of meat? You know, you put tenderize on it, you beat it with like a, uh, what they call a cooking hammer, has the edges on it, but just to tenderize it. But just like our hearts, our hearts need to be softened, and God's Spirit can do that. One thing we're going to talk about, though, do we do we make excuses for our sins, or you know, are we broken before Jesus? Do we need Him? Are we kind of like when you talk about the Beatitudes, being poor in spirit, meaning meaning destitute of self. Our hearts need to be tender and soft before God. And now, the second individual of, in the verse should be seen as Jesus Himself. So let, let's continue on. It says, "But who can endure the day coming?" And who can stand when he appears? For he would be like a refiner's fire, like the fuller's soap. Now, we know from chapter 1 and 2 that the Lord spoke out against the priesthood from their 
bad behavior and, and not really, they went through the motions, but they really didn't, um, they didn't um, serve God with, with a genuine spirit, or a genuine heart. They just did it through the motions. It was almost like hirelings. They, were, they just did, did it for the job. But it's interesting, though, that we know that Jesus didn't come um, the, in the first time as a judge, but he will come in the second time as a judge. John 3, 16 through 18 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world may be saved through him, or might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe, believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God so let's look at a little bit even when it's and it says for he is like a refiner's fire like a fuller soap think about a refiner's fire even like when they make jewelry like sometimes your gold necklaces aren't always gold because gold is a soft thing but when when, a, when something's putting in the fire to refine all the dross all the all the bad things all the things the impurities they come to the surface of uh, at the, the material that you're melting and they skim it off they, they take it off there's a, a process taking it off so that whatever product like whether it's silver or gold or any material you want to have it's pure it's it's a hundred percent of what that what you want in that and and this is what's going to happen in, in the scriptures that um, even even in Corinthians we'll go to Corinthians real quick go to first Corinthians chapter 3. And Paul describes the fire process in the New Testament that the things, even the things how we build our foundations are in Christ. Now, he speaks of this, that no one can build anything other than their foundation other than on Christ. As believers, we need to build our foundation on Christ with the things of Christ. But how many know as believers, sometimes we can use any other material we want to to build our foundation. And Paul is basically saying, we can choose our own building materials, whether it's wood, hay, or stubble, or gold, silver, or precious stones. Now, he spoke of a day when God would put our lives on test. He would put us in the refiner's fire. <clears throat> you know, think about the refiner's fire. You know, is it, a, is it a furnace? Is it a fire that actually comes? Or could it be just God's presence? Can you imagine being in God's presence and it's just like you could just feel all the, all the, just the negative, all the bad things in our lives that be shredded off of us? Because we'll be in the presence of God. But all things done that we have done in the flesh will be burned up. Uh, even in Hebrews, you can look it up on your own. It's, God is a consuming fire. But it goes in in First, First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 through 13. It says, For no one can lay a foundation other than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on a foundation with gold, silver, and precious stone, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will be disclosed it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. So Paul's just re it. You know, I just, you know, from what Paul said, kind of what I said, so listen, but some people will lose everything. I mean, they will survive by the skin of their teeth. I mean, they'll get into heaven. But everything they have done, we could say, you know, did they, all, they did it all in the flesh. Now, there might be some things that, you know, there'll be people that, that have done things in the Spirit and they will get great reward. And there will be people who've done everything in the flesh and have absolutely nothing. Bare essentials. And see, the Jews were looking for the coming of the Lord. But they were confused. They got confused with His first and second coming. The Jews camped on the Messiah as a deliverer in Malachi and with other prophets. They counted on him right there and then. And we know that even from the New Testament, they thought Jesus, when he actually came in the flesh, he's going to get rid of the Romans. No. You know, and even now, that there's some, some they say they can't wait for the day of the Lord. And, and, and even in the prophets of Malachi are saying, listen, don't, don't, don't yearn and don't be joyful for the day of the Lord because you're going to face hardship and, and difficulty. The day of the Lord for the Jew will be a day of purifying. It'll be a day of refining fire. Because it goes on in verse 3 and 4, it says, and he's, He will sit as a refiner, a purifier of silver, and He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings and righteous to the Lord. Now remember, remember the last two chapters we talked about God going towards the priest, saying, hey, listen, you're doing it wrong. You're giving me bad sacrifices. He says, 
at this point, it won't. It will be these will be righteous ones to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and the Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old, as the former year. So at one time, something had happened. Is listen, God is telling them, listen, Israel. After all the things I have confronted you about, there will be a time of refining fire, and I will place it back in order that I have all been telling you about, and that you will be purified. And then true and righteous sacrifices will be made in my name. You know, it's interesting because he said, it says, you know, days of old and as the former, and in the former years, meaning there was a time that they did it right. And then something happened where, for me personally, my, my belief, and it part might be yours, they begin to intermingle with different cultures and they allow things in their lives that they shouldn't have. And, it, and, and, and serving God became more of a monotonous thing, more of a ritual instead of a genuine relationship with God. Verse 5 says, Then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired workers and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who excuse me, thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Now he says, I am coming for those who did these things that have no fear in me, of me. They just don't fear God. These people, they feel, they feel that God will never come and hold them accountable for, they, for the way they've lived their lives. You can remember though, most of these people, from, from what I gather when I read, a lot of them had brought everything from Babylon out and they kept it. And they passed it on. And this is what God's going to refine. He's going to keep on refining. He says, Then I will draw near for you to judgment. This is a word the Jews needed to hear because they misread some of the, the prophecies. It says, I am going to judge you to set things right. This book is very much for Israel. And for us to glean off of this, you know, he was speaking to, 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 to the nation of Israel. But if you take this as God was speaking to us, what in our lives is God wanting to purify us with? Now, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, and He's in there saying, hey, you know, these are some of the things we need to get out of our lives. Remember, He's a gentleman. He's not going to force you. But God's, God's Spirit is inside each one of us telling us what to get rid of in our lives, whether it's actions, speaking, what we visualize. So why? So we can be refined. So we, it's a sanctification progress process of, you know, going from what we, what we had in the world going to more towards the, the kingdom of God. But now God moves on to another area in confrontment to his people. Verse 6. On your scripture it said like robbing God. It says, For I the Lord do not change. Remember that. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. And what God is saying this in this first verse is that I have a lot against you and coming for judgment. I, will, I won't destroy you completely. I will destroy the sin in, from Israel but not you because I do not change. It's important that we know that. Now you may think, what does God, what does God, what does God not changing have to do with him not destroying them completely? Now listen, his promise is that he wouldn't, he wouldn't, that he would, that they would be his people and I would, and I will make me and God, God will make good in his promises. I don't change, God's saying. I don't I don't change, meaning I will not go back on my word. We can go back on our word. Have you ever anybody, had anybody go back on their word? When they say, hey, you know what? And I'll do this for you. I'll do that for you. I'll help you here. I'll help you there. I'll do this. When you go up and ask them, say, you know, remember you said this? Eh, well, I'm not going to do it. See, God can't go back on his word. Listen, a promise, maybe you've heard this statement. A promise is only, now listen, a promise is only as good as the person who makes it. Would you not agree? The reason we stand on the promises of God is not because they are written in the Bible. It's because we know who made the promise. To understand and know the character of God is then that we will read and, and believe in His promise. We need to know who God is. We need to understand who God is. See, 
I can rest in Him and know that He will fulfill every promise He said. And it's important for us to know the character of God. Now listen, for, for, for a good example, if I have someone that comes to me whose character is questionable to me, maybe He promises me something that's for my benefit, but I know whose who character. I'll probably say, yeah, I'll be shaking my head, okay. But inside I'm thinking, there ain't no way, yeah, right, this guy's never going to do this. His word's no good. It's a character flaw. It's a character thing I'm looking at. He'll never fulfill what he says because of who that person is. Because what? Of history. Because of track records. When we understand God and who he is, we will know that we can take his promises to the bank, knowing that he will fulfill it because of God's personal character. And, and the sad thing about this is some don't know Jesus personally. You know, I'm not talking about the people, I mean, you know, some people just say the words and they're forgiven. But then they go on and live their own life. And I, I don't know how you can do that. But they don't really understand or know him. See, we can know him, we know him, and we can we can speak in a confidence of the promises because we know who gave them. We know that Jesus' word is good. Verse 7 says, From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statues and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you. It's important. Here's a promise right here. Says the Lord of hosts, But you say, How shall we return? Now, now hear this verse, because this is a promise. And we need to get this through our own heads. If there's any distance between you and I, or you and God, I mean, not you and I, but if there's a distance between you and God, it's not God's fault, it's your fault. It's our fault. God wants a close, intimate relationship with His children, and we put Him at arm's length or arm's distance at some time. That, this, is right here, this is a promise. Listen, it says, From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and not have kept them. But listen, it says what? Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Right? That's a promise. If we will draw near to God, He will draw near to us. When we draw near to Him, He will act on that. That's who God is. Jesus said, "You, where your treasure is, your heart will also be. Matthew 6, 21 says that. It says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also be. It's true. The things you value your most in your life is from what's in your heart. What do you value most in your life? Be honest. Just, you know, think about it. What's most important to you right now? Honestly, your first thing should be God. That should be your first thing with God. Then the second one should be your wife or your husband, depending on your spouse, if you're male or female. And then it should be your kids, your family, your immediate, your children. And then your family. And then you you fill the rest of the blank. But for me, it's it's sometimes my wife gets mad, but I say to her, "You're really my second love." And sometimes she gets mad about that, but it's true. God should be my first love, then my wife, then my children. You know, and one day I'll have grandchildren, then my extended family. This is true. This is where it needs to be. That's where my heart is. Amen? Where is your heart? Where is your treasure? What is what is your treasure to you? So you're saying, how do we return, they ask? Okay, let's look at obedience. Go to verse 8 and 9. It says, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me, but you say, how have we robbed you? He says, in your tithes and your contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Now, it's interesting, they act like they have no clue, but God is clarifying, outlined in the law of Moses that where they, are, where they were instructed to do. God is basically saying, we had a covenant agreement about tithing. Now, you and I are not under the law of Moses, which was, which, which was spoken to the Israelites. That's something Old Testament, the Old Covenant. And he's saying to them, you are under a curse because of your disobedience. You have to think about this, though. You have to admit, it's daring for them to steal from God. 
right? A lot of people say, well, God doesn't need my money. No, but he wants your heart, and that's where your heart is. That's where the money is, that's where your heart is. And if you steal and got caught, I hope you'd be ashamed. But it didn't seem like they were ashamed. At least not all of them. But it says this, Bring the fruit, the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be fine in my house. And thereby put me to test, says the Lord of hosts. Another promise coming. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no, there is no more need. Now, I know a lot of not modern day Christians use this. Use scriptures. And he's like, well, sometimes you got to be careful what scripture you use for convenience. Now, the main reason why God was asking for the, we'll go through a little bit of tithing. It says, for the priests, and there was supposed to be food for the priests and food for the poor. Now, look here, it is another promise. But what is the definition of robbing? Basically, it's taking something that belongs to somebody else. The tithes belong to me, says God, and you're keeping it from me, you're robbing me, and you are using it for yourself. And he challenges them this way, that in their giving of their first fruits, he will bless their socks off. Now listen, we think we're in different areas, but they were giving a lot more. They were giving more of their grain. They were giving more of their fruit. They were giving of their herbs. They were giving everything, say 10%, a little bit. We'll get we'll get in that a little bit. But they were giving, ours is just not writing a check or throwing a couple bucks into the plate. But what we'll get to that is what we offer God is it um, is it with a good intention, good heart? Is it something he asked us to do? Because it says, I'll show you how he's going to continually bless them. He says, I will rebuke the devourer from you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, of your vine, and the field shall not fare to bear, or fill the bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations, not just some, all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Now God is just reiterating what he had told them in the Mosaic Law. You know, give me first fruits and, and I will fulfill my promise. There's, there's a promise there. You do your part, I'll do my part. Proverbs 3, 9 through 12 says this, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the fruits of your produce. Then the barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, but weary of his reproof. Or be wary of his reproof. Don't but be wary. For the Lord reproves him who he loves and as a father and a son in whom he delights. Look, God looks at the tithing thing as an honoring to him. When people hold back their tithe, it shows a dishonoring to God. Tithe means tenth. Ten percent, what belongs to God. But it doesn't mean that the other ninety belongs to you or me. It still, everything still belongs to God. And the ten percent which belongs to God was an act of honor and respect, of gratitude for what God has been doing in their lives. The 90 was, was uh, for them to do what they seemed, what was right or seemed fit, uh, to do as a good steward of God. For them, it was, you know, when they, like I mentioned, when they, when they gave their tithes, they gave crops, they gave their herds, they gave them everything of their lives. So you figure, they're giving everything that they have, they're tithing. They're tithing towards God. Why? Because it's an act of honor, respect, and gratitude. But here, excuse me, God was correcting him, saying, Dude, you haven't been doing it. So does tithing affect us today? Should we tithe? Now listen, we I'm gonna say this on air. We are not under the Mosaic law. This was a unique covenant between God and Israel. Now here we go. The New Testament does not say believers are to tithe 10%. Are we under the law? Because that was written under the law. But don't start smiling because you feel that you don't have to tithe anymore. Because I'm about, I'm about to show you New Testament tithing. 2 Corinthians verse, or chapter 9, verse 6 through 9 says, At the point of this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will Will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his. Now let's look at this way. Wherever your translation says, Second Corinthians chapter nine, his heart. But I'm going to say his or her heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. 
and it goes all, it keeps on going down. It says, and God is able to make all grace abound in you so that you are having all sufficiency in all things at all times, that you might abound in every good work. Paul is giving us the New Testament idea and how believers are to give. He says, listen, it's up to you. And what you give, are you honoring God in what you give? What is God asking you to give? See, a lot of people said, oh, I gave my 10%, I'm good with God. Are you really? Because Christian, New Testament Christians shouldn't be going back and forth where it pleases them. A New Testament Christian should begin, okay, God, here's my paycheck, how much do you want? And then I'll, I'll, I'll live on the rest. That's how, that's how it is, but it's just not in your, in, your, in your finances. It's in everything. It's you. God wants you. And everything you do, He wants you. So when we think about, well, yeah, God doesn't want us to tithe, or tithe 10% in the New Testament. That's true. But He wants you to tithe everything. He wants you to offer everything. Everything you have is His. That means, say you get paid $500 a week. Okay, God, what do you want me to give? That's the first thing we should do. Really, think about it. If a farmer plants a seed every six foot, okay, think about this. You plant a seed every six foot. Like my, like my wife and daughter just planted a garden. Now, some of them ones grow in the ground real fast, and they cover ground, and some grow straight up. How many seeds you plant is how much harvest you get. So if a farmer plants a seed every six foot, then don't expect a big harvest. But if he plants a farmer plants a generous has a generous arm, meaning he plants a seed every six inches, uh, he'll have his harvest will be much crop. It's a simple principle to learn. You know, sowing and reaping. Give according to what's on your heart. But it's important to understand we are not to give reluctantly, but we are to sow into God's work. We are. So whenever you give, give joyfully, give generously, give freely, and give cheerfully. But whatever you do, don't give out of compulsion. 2 Corinthians 8.12 says, For if there's readiness is there, it is acceptable according to the, what a person has, not according to what he does not have. Now you say, what's that mean? This verse is not often taught for many reasons. See, some, some pastors out there don't care. They'll say, you know what? Church has bills and you need to pay up. Okay? It's kind of like you, you sometimes what, I think sometimes in my, this is me on my soapbox, but when you see the televangelist or you see uh, fundraisers, and I understand everybody needs to, they need to raise money to keep ministry going forward. I'm not begrudging that. There's a lot of great ministries out there who ask for, for, for fundraising and and every dime they put puts goes towards preaching the gospel and that's great. But I'm kind of, sometimes I get on my soapbox is that, you know, maybe see a fundraiser or a radio or a person, a TV evangelist, and they say, well, you know what, we want you to give. It doesn't matter how much, even if you can't afford it, send your check in and believe God will pay your bills another way. Or maybe God will send you money. Take a step of faith and you'll put it on your credit card. Even if you don't have it now, stand in faith that God will build your faith up and watch God move in your finance. And they start quoting the book of Malachi. And, you know, and they say, stand in faith because God wants, you, wants to stretch you. And, and what happens is they, they put their burden on you. And sometimes people give out a compulsion. Oh, i got to help this person. i got to help this person. And sometimes we give and we get robbed. In a sense, and instead of the person asking for money, standing in your faith, he's asking you to do something that's not even biblical. Give when you don't have it. Now, I'm not talking. Now, listen. It's 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 about what I'm talking about is people manipulating people out of money. Listen, you need to give when God tells you to give. Plain and simple. See, it, it, that scripture meant the gift is acceptable in what you have. Listen, if the checkbook says no, then you don't write it. If the checkbook says yes, and then if God's leading you to do it, then you do it. But just be careful of the TV stars that shovel some garbage down your throat who people are just fleecing the sheep and leave time. You know, I've, I've been in situations, I've, I've been to, to teachings, and the teachings were really good. But I've been to places where they take three or four offerings a day. 
they have um, they've asked for titles. They asked for titles for land and vehicles and deeds and, and it's just and people give out a compulsion and they wonder what happened and they think, well, I got you know, I gave to God, I gave to God all these years, and we're going to get into this because um, this is this is kind of like where we're going. Is I gave to God all these years, I never got anything back. And, and we as believers, we know that in the New Testament, everything we have is God's, and we just need to be obedient when He says, "Give, you give." And if you want to give outside, like the different things, take your time before you give and praise God. Is this something I should do? Is it in my budget? Is it in my finances? Or is this what you want me to do, Father? And then if He says, "Yeah, again, give, give it to Him," good, do it. But just but before you give, you think. Don't give out of because the next guy. Maybe you're in a church and you're giving, or the guy next to you gives, and you're like, oh, "I don't have that much money." Or you know. Give because God instructs you to give. We are to give. But it really comes on to when we do give, is our gift, our gift to God, is it honoring Him with gratitude? And that's what He's trying to say. Malachi is saying in this place. Are you giving and honoring God in this? That's what tithing is. Giving back to God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 3 and 4 says, But when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. You know, yeah, sometimes you get those people that, you know, and they, they, the, the pastor or the evangelist or whoever he says holds up a card and says, Who wants to give $1,000 right now for the kingdom of God? You know, and, and here comes this guy running down. I'll give you, I'll take five of them. Basically, you know what? When you give, don't broadcast it. Just drop it in the box. Drop it in the offering plate. Put it in the mail, or go online and do it. That's what that's that's what that's talking about. It says so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Your giving is between you and God because your gift, your tithe, your offering, your tithe is giving to God. God, I honor you. I thank you for for the ability to give. Now, Lord, what do you want me to do with the ninety percent that's left over? And he'll say, okay, well, you got some bills, pay your bills. There is some free stuff, you know. If you really sit down and talk to God, he will instruct you. In verse 13 through 15 says, And your words have been hard against me, says the Lord, but you say, How have we spoken against you? And you have said, It is in vain to serve God. What is it profit of, of our keeping in, with charge or walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant, blessed, evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Now, in a sense, the people were pointing the finger back at themselves saying things like this about the Lord. They were saying their worship and their service to God was empty. For all of this, what they're really saying is saying, hey, for all of my obedience, I don't see any big payment coming my way. If anybody ever felt like that, Lord, all the things I've done for you, and look, I'm still in debt. Or all the things I've done for you, and I'm still killing myself. They're saying, listen, we invest and we received nothing. But the other guy over there who doesn't care about you, God, at all is overwhelmed with money and they're prospering. What did I gain from serving with God? And my, my question to you is this. If you've ever said this, don't serve God to get anything from Him. Our serving God should be not to gain something from God. Our serving God is to serve Him and to have a relationship with Him. God is not a vending machine. Um, think about the rich young ruler who had uh, everything. Remember? And you can go back and study the rich young ruler and find out what did Jesus say. See, God is saying how far they moved away from Him and they look at Him as a vending machine. Go back to the beginning of the covenant. You do this, you prosper. You do this, you prosper. You do this, you prosper. But they didn't prosper because they brought a curse on themselves because they were disobedient to God. The last section should be, the book of remembrance should be on, on, your, on your scripture. But it says in verse 16, and those who feared the Lord spoke with one another, and the Lord paid attention and heard them. And the book of remembrance was written before him and the, of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. 
They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make my treasured possession up, up my treasured possessions. And I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. And once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. Now, now God was speaking to the nation of Israel, and there there must have been a group of them who realized they were guilty. We know when they talked and God heard in what they were saying. Because it says this, in verse 16, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. So there was a small group in them, not that many, but it says the Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. So there was something that happened that there was a group of people saying, Listen, dude, listen, guys, we are guilty as charged. You know, we got to stop justifying our actions. we got to stop justifying ourselves and quit making excuses. That's what they're saying. And they said, we need to get back in right relationship with God. That they were saying, we cannot stay in, in complacency and respond to God uh, because we know that there will be a day God will judge and judgment is coming, even from the scriptures. It says, once again, you shall see a distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve Him. Matthew 7, verse 24 through 27 says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And when the rain fell, the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And when the rain fell and the floods came and the whole, or I'm sorry, and the winds blew and beat against that house, it fell and a great was the fall. Chapter 3, God was trying to show continually a refining fire of God's people. He's saying, listen, my promises are true. I've fulfilled my promises. You do your part, I'll do my part. You will be blessed. I want to have covenant relationship. I want to have a living relationship with you. You know, it's almost like for me, God saying, I want you to focus on you, yourself, and alone. Meaning, don't blame nobody. Don't cause issues. Follow me. Keep your eyes focused on me. Listen to my leading. Listen to my guidance. Hear my spirit. And you will be blessed. Not that you're not going to have issues, but you will be blessed. You know, and and as we, you know, even the scripture tells us, and it's even Psalms, as we live as living sacrifices to God. You know, when I think about going back to tithing, we we need to tithe us too. In everything, we everything that we have is God's, and everything we do for Him, we need to honor Him and respect Him, and do it with a genuine heart. Not to do it because other people see us or because we hold a position in a church somewhere. Because we'll stand before God for everything. And even as Paul said, what's burned, what's in the flesh will be burned up. Maybe there will be some of you out there who will get it just by the skin of your teeth. I don't want to live a life like that. I want to do things for God the right way. I want to honor God with everything that I do. And, and I can stand right before God to God. I did everything I could for you. And I, and I, I, you know what? I want to be blameless before God. Well, that's it for this evening. We have one more chapter left. And then, if you have any ideas of what we can do for after the Minor Prophets, just let me know. Um, but next week, uh, we'll be wrapping up 
uh, Malachi. Be blessed and have a great evening. Bye.